just a quick production note. Uh, I know I said that we were going to do Jimmy Carter this week, but then I looked at the calendar and realized it was Valentine's Day, and I had this show farther down on the hopper, and I bumped it up because I'm very bad at schedule management. Now on with the show. Oh, no, it, it, it's a box of chocolates. It's, it's for you. I, uh, I already ate all the good ones, so, you know, you can have what's left. Yes. The following podcast contains... You used to be a kind, loving man, and now you're a foul-mouthed monster. Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you thought you'd meet your soulmate by striking up a conversation in the poetry section of a bookstore, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host, Dave Bledsoe, and this is episode number 350, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places edition of the show, where we were talking about finding love before we had the internet. Stay tuned. The What the Hell Are You Thinking podcast is brought to you by Harsh Reality, the dating surface for people who need to lower their standards. Are you looking for love in all the wrong places, and are you aiming for the moon and blowing up on the pad? Are you constantly asking yourself... What is wrong with me? Harsh Realities is here to answer that question. Our team of experts will examine you for who you actually are, physically, emotionally, financially, and come up with a dating profile suitable to the real you. Then we will find a match based on the kind of person you realistically have a shot with. At Harsh Realities, we know you look at Pete Davidson and think, well, if he can do it, so can I. And we're here to tell you, you're no Pete Davidson. You need to accept some harsh realities. Hello. It's late. It's Saturday night. You're home alone watching the show. You're probably a very lonely individual. Let's cut to the chase. You're kind of pathetic, aren't you? Well, that's why you should call Lowered Expectations. Our video library is packed with thousands of chronically rejected singles just like you. Lester, number 289. I am a man of the senses. I want a woman who knows the smell of crayons, who, who loves the way the nut tastes on her tongue. A woman who knows the difference between the taste of hot sweat and fear sweat and exercise sweat and sex sweat and fever sweat. And more than that, I crave you. And the way your, your skin tastes after you ate the macaroni. And the way your brassiere smells when you want me. And, and the way I can tell whether your eyes are green or blue from the taste of your tears. And I want you to want me, to know me, to know how my skin feels after I drink a fishbowl full of whiskey. And the way my tongue tastes sweet after I have taken a life. I also like sailing, long walks on the beach, and horseback riding. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Vanessa, westbound 289. Lowered expectations. When you've been blown off by the rest, settle for second best. Back in the 70s when I was a kid, Valentine's Day would be quite the experience. We all got a little uh, ritual humiliation as a learning experience. We'd be forced to create these uh, paper sacks with <laughs> red construction paper hearts on them so all the kids in class could put Valentine's cards in them for all the other kids in class. And uh, you might ask yourself, as I repeatedly ask myself, what were we expected to learn from this? Who cares? No one will ever love you. That's exactly what we were expected to learn. Now, <laughs> I can only assume that kids today... Well, they have something like this, but since kids today are soft and coddled and prohibited by law from experiencing anything unpleasant until they're of legal drinking age, it's probably a vastly different experience. Because when I was a kid, kids were... Kids are not separated by intelligence. The weak are picked on. And it made us the strong, well-balanced, nihilistic alcoholics we are today. For example... There's no way in hell a modern teacher would not examine the valentine slipped into a bag for all kinds of things an unpopular kid might receive on said cards. Instead of things like, be my valentine, maybe the message would be, you're a fat ginger kid that's only been in the school for six months so no one knows you or likes you and honestly we hope you die. Or, if they were kinder kids, 
Happy Valentine's Day, whatever your name is. Thanks, I guess. As an unpopular kid, you probably wouldn't have gotten many of any cards, but the rule was is that everyone had to have cards for all the other kids in class. But somehow, the cute popular kids always seemed to have more cards than, say, the fat ginger kids who'd been at the school for only six months because their dad was in the military and he moved around a lot. You seem to be handling this well. <laughs> you think I'm talking about me? No, man, I, I was one of the cool kids. I'm, I got tons of cards that never had hurtful things written on them about how my stomach made the buttons of my shirt pop off or <laughs> how my big red hair made me look like howdy duties. No, no, and I always had lots and lots of cards in my bag, dozens of them, just because, you know, some of the kids in class got Hershey's kids on their cards, and one time I got a cat turd taped to mine. I mean, no, no, I was, I was super popular. Everyone loved old Dave. Dave who? I'm not here to talk about childhood trauma. I'm here because it's Valentine's Day and I want to talk about young adult trauma. Namely, the kind of trauma that was dating before we had the internet. How is that even possible? Not only was it possible, in many ways it was actually worse than modern forms of dating. I should know because I tried all of them and failed spectacularly. I, uh, this is a history podcast, so I'll go into a short history of love and marriage through the ages. Oh, you don't have to do that. No. Please. In the earliest days of human evolution, things were enormously less complicated. You probably lived in a small band of hunter-gatherers, maybe 50 people altogether, and you were all related. So when it came to looking for love, there was only one choice. She's your cousin. She's your cousin. As we settled into agrarian societies, you might live in a village with a couple of hundred people so you had more choices than just your cousin. You know, an awful lot of people still went the cousin route. So gross. Which probably explains a lot about humanity when you think about it. Times changed, civilizations grew, marriages evolved, and uh, specifically they evolved into a financial transaction exchanging women for valuable livestock and land. What about love? Please, we're talking about marriage that has nothing to do with love. I'm sure people felt all the feels that came with wanting to exchange their genetic code with other people, but that wasn't relevant to the men who were doing the exchanges of the valuable livestock and lands. Throughout all of this, one did not need to worry about finding someone that was handled by the man in charge of Family X, whose son would marry daughter from Family Y in exchange for 28 cows and 10 acres of pasture. This was how things worked for most of human history. It wasn't until the Enlightenment that the idea of marrying for love entered Western society. And make no mistake, it's still a predominantly Western society thing. Arranged marriages are still very common throughout the world. And in many cultures, monogamy isn't even really a thing. I want to go to there. You and me both, Liz Lemon. Now, I'm not here to talk about marriage and the relative merits of monogamy. I'm just bringing it up to say that for most of history, finding someone for a relationship just wasn't a problem, which is why we remain so very, very bad at it. A lot of people looked at the example of their parents for some kind of guidance on how they should go about finding a partner for themselves. Bad idea. It is a bad idea, especially in the days before one could simply log on and search for love in all the wrong places. Now, my parents were worse than usual when it came to relationship advice because they met in fucking church of all places. And every time I'd complain about how I didn't really know how to talk to girls, their answer would always be the same thing. Now, would you give church another try? I know a lot of people meet their partners in church, and if you're a church person, that's all well and good. But I'm not a church person, and so my going to church looking for love would at best be disingenuous and at worst would have resulted in my being a teenage father. Once I moved out on my own, things did not get simpler in the dating arena. As a young adult in the 1980s and early 90s, we had three options for meeting people that we could date. We could meet them at work, we could meet them from our friends, and we could meet them at a bar. All of these remain viable and popular options today, and all of them suck just as much now as they did then. Allow me to explain in detail how all of these were terrible and how they were terrible in their own unique fashion. And, you know, I guess today we shouldn't complain. We've added a fourth terrible option in the fourth form of online dating, so y'all got that going for you, which is nice.
Now, I use the term work, but the same rules apply to college since that's work for many young people. I just happen to have been in the military at the same time as most people were generally attending college, so the same rules applied to the military as to college. Indeed, having gone to college right after leaving the military, the only real difference between the two is there are rather more guns around in the military. The youth, the drinking, and the horniness, that's just the same. I have to say I find it a little disconcerting. Well, think about it. I mean, young people in the best shape they're ever going to be in their lives, all living in close proximity, there's going to be a lot of fucking going on. Before the internet, you found yourself going out with people in close proximity to where you spent the majority of your time. Be that an office, a foxhole, or a dormitory. It had the charm of being serendipitous. You could be folding your laundry and look up to see one folding their skivvies and strike up a conversation, only discover that you have so much in common. Oh, I love meat cute stories. Well, duh, you have so much in common. You live and work in the same damn place. So naturally, you're gonna have a lot in common. Before long, you're dating, well, you're fucking anyway, and annoying your roommates with all the constant sex when all they want to do is watch Star Trek The Next Generation in peace when they come home from work. Now they got to listen to your moaning and sucking over Data explaining to Tasha how he's... Data, you are fully functional, aren't you? Of course, but... How fully? In every way, of course. I am programmed in multiple techniques. A broad variety of pleasuring. Oh. Uh. And eventually that what you thought was so much in common was really just proximity. And now that you've seen one another naked, you have to figure out whether or not you actually even like each other. Oh, it's a hard no, babe. And the biggest problem with dating where you work is that when, and I do mean when and not if, it all falls apart, that very proximity that hooked you up in the first place is going to be a real pain in your ass. Sooner or later, you're going to have to go back to the same laundry room or the party or the foxhole with the person that you used to fuck and are now not fucking. And things will be awkward. At least online, you can usually spot some of the red flags about the other person before it turns into that awkward encounter. Maybe the other person cares more about watching Star Trek The Next Generation than talking about their day or they don't separate their whites from their colors. You could screen out those sort of problems before you fuck. Back in the olden times, we had to figure that shit out as we went along. Like I said, in the pre-enlightenment days, it was your family that decided who'd you marry. But in the early modern times, but before internet dating, it was your friends that decided who you would date. This is an awful idea. True. Commonly known as the setup, a friend of yours would usually... For selfish reasons, like they really wanted to fuck someone, but that someone's friend kept getting in the way of their action, would introduce you to someone who was just... She is perfect for you. And you, of course, will resist this because deep in your soul, you know it's a bad idea. But after weeks of incessant nagging, your friend will eventually browbeat you into going out on a date with this other person. This was called a blind date which before the age of social media was literally true. You went in cold and blind to any details about the other person other than the vague generalities your friend probably just made up. The two of you would meet somewhere. Back in those days, it was almost always a movie because even if they were a real uggo, you could at least stare at a young Leo DiCaprio waiting to drown for two and a half hours before you made your excuses and peace the fuck out. You're such a gentleman. <laughs> hey, I use gender neutral pronouns for a reason. You think a guy can't be an uggo? Have you ever seen Gavin? Friend setups weren't all bad, but they rarely worked out the way they were intended by the friend who set you up. What happened a lot of time was the people that were set up hit it off super well, and the friend who set you up to get that person out of the way flamed out and then completely resented you for your relationship. Now, all of a sudden, they're telling you, These two, <laughs> they will never last. Well, Jesus, Jennifer, two weeks ago, you were saying we were perfect for each other. Now you're convinced we're doomed? Huh, how does that work out? Of course, uh, there was the other way your friends set you up with people. They uh, started dating someone that eventually you wound up dating. Aww, I don't like where this is going. Sometimes when two people date, they're really only dating because one or both of them are friends with people that one or both of them would rather be dating rather than the person they are dating. This happened a lot when I was young. 
There were times it was like some kind of country line dance where everyone would switch partners. Only instead of someone saying do si do, there would usually just be uh, fistfights and broken friendships. It wasn't always a negative thing when you did a partner switch. I mean, I, I wound up dating a girl named Michelle who I met because she was first dating my roommate who was getting out of the military in a few weeks. He left. She stayed. She pretty just much moved from his bed into mine. It wasn't anything sorted. It just sort of happened. Honestly, it was one of the best relationships young me ever had. We dated for like six months or so until she realized that I was in no way interested in marriage or children, and we broke up pretty amicably. That really skewed my expectations of what dating would be like through my 20s. Made me think that two people could have sex for months and then be like, Well, see you later. I thought it would always be that easy, but come to find out... I unfriend you. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. And when you undate them, they got angry. Since work and being set up by your friends were such horrible methods, the usual way we met someone pretender was by getting loaded at the bar and waking up with a stranger. This was a bad idea. True, very true. But it was the most common idea for decades until someone decided to swipe in in whatever direction you guys swipe in came along. You all know how this one works. You've seen you guys doing it today. You put on clothes that you think make you look good. You head to a place where other single people or at least people pretending to be single mingle. And then you buy drinks for people until you find someone drunk enough, desperate enough, or horny enough to talk to you. And if you tell just the right mix of truth and lies, maybe they will have sex with you. I hear a lot of horror stories about online dating. And yeah, I get it. Some guy being a total creep in a text message is fucked up. But compared to say... Oh, I don't know, waking up blindly, hung over on a Sunday morning, naked in a bed you've never been in before, unsure of how you got there and who exactly you're in there with, only to turn your head and see a naked woman thumbing through the pages of the Bible smiling at you. And when she realizes you're awake, she proceeds to inform you that in the eyes of the Lord, the two of you had consummated your wedding last night and all that remained now was to head down to her church and make it official. And what you really want to say in a moment like that is, uh, um, what was your name again? But you can't say that because you're pretty sure you'll get stabbed. So you smile and you say, sure, absolutely. Let me, uh, let me just go take a quick shower before we go to church. And then you crawl out her window and run for your life through the Northern California trailer park, hoping to find your way to a highway to pay phone before she notices you're spending an awful long time in the shower and starts looking for you. Oh, that is an oddly specific detail. That's just something that happened to some guy I knew. I mean, just uh, some uh, random guy that I knew once upon a time. Just totally random guy. Not me. Now, honestly, all this dating nonsense was just too much trouble for me. I figured out pretty early on a way to circumvent all the difficulties of dating. Oh, this ought to be good. You see, rather than constantly trying to look for that special someone, I could just look for someone. I learned that if I just went to the right places, say, you know, the base enlisted club at the right time, say, during a really big deployment, a large number of women would be looking for a friend. A friend for while their husband was overseas. And you strike up conversations, you buy a couple of drinks, you be a good listener, and uh, you could find yourself in a mutually satisfactory short-term relationship where everyone involved knew there was an expiration date. There was no pretending I was Mr. Right. I could just be Mr. Right now until the deployment was over and everyone could go back to their previous lives, no harm done, so long as everyone used appropriate contraception. And yes, I hear you saying, That's adultery! To which I reply, Technically, I have never committed adultery because I have never been married. What I was doing was more like, Sophistry. Which is fine because I never studied Greek and I didn't know what that word meant. Some of you probably thought that I would be doing a show about things like, I don't know, video dating or computer dating or even classified personal ads as a way to find love before we had computers. And what you got in the end was uh, implausible insinuations about my sex life. And I can understand that why you're angry. That's fair. But you know what? Yeah, those things existed pre-online dating. But you want to know a secret about them? No, nah, not, not, not really. Nobody used them. Video dating was a niche product in Los Angeles and to a lesser extent New York City and computer dating was just a scam. Their existence made for good television hooks but had very little impact on dating in their time. 
Now, personal ads, technically a lot of people did use classified dating ads. Classified dating was the descendant of the Lonely Hearts Clubs, which were clubs set up to match make people in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Single women could meet single men, exchange letters, and eventually be murdered by someone they met in the Lonely Hearts Clubs. Famous Lonely Hearts included H.H. H. Holmes of Chicago, Belle Gunness of Indiana, and Martha Beck and Ray Fernandez. But in the 1970s, with the sexual revolution at its peak, some people did find love in the newspaper, and they worked similar to online dating. You put an ad in the paper stating the kind of person you were, the kind of person you were looking for, and hope that someone found you like you might find a secondhand patio set. Then you would exchange letters, maybe a phone call before you arranged to meet in person where one of you would murder the other. I'm sorry, that's unfair. People weren't always murdered by the people they met in a personal ad. Sometimes they would just never show up. Like you would find yourself with a bouquet of flowers waiting at the bus station for Agnes in Omaha to show up, but Agnes would never show up. That's because she'd been murdered in a bus station in Illinois. Dating was hard back then. There's probably a full episode about personal ads that I probably should have done this week, but instead I wanted to make bad jokes about my horrible dating life because it's Valentine's Day, and I hate Valentine's Day with a passion. It isn't that I'm a lonely, bitter old man getting drunk by himself in a podcast studio. It is kind of true, though. But it's because Valentine's Day is a holiday designed to sell candy and flowers and has fuck all to do with love and romance. I felt that way even when I was dating someone. How are you still single? Uh, right? Hey, I'm a fucking catch. Ask anyone I've ever dated if we're still on speaking terms, which admittedly, most of us aren't. What I'm trying to say is there is no good way to find that special someone. They are all bad in their own unique ways, and you shouldn't worry too much about how you meet your special someone. I mean, hell, I, I met someone online at a prodigy chat room. Didn't plan on it. Just happened. I also met someone at a college party when I quoted Lord of the Rings to her. I would have married both of these girls if I wasn't the sort of person who, you know, didn't fuck up relationships just because I could. There are even arranged marriages today that wind up in love matches, though I would never go that route because I don't want my parents marrying me off to some 50-something-year-old woman from their church. Unless, of course... That 50-year-old woman was a total freak in the bedroom. Then maybe I would think about it, just as long as we never had to go to church. Yeah, dating sucks. Dating's supposed to suck. If it were easy and simple, we would all be married off to one another because our parents coveted the oxen on the next farm over. So stop your bitching and get to swiping or whatever the fuck you kids are doing today. Me, I'm out of the dating game for at least another few years, but I have a plan. Oh, do I have a plan. When I hit 65, I'm going to head down to the old folks' home to scope out all the widows or septuagenarians whose old man has got the Alzheimer's. And I'll be like, hey, babe, why don't you hop on your rascal and scoot that fine ass on over and we can get your freak on in my Craftmatic adjustable bed. Now there's a bed that automatically adjusts to fit your body's contour. It's the famous Craftmatic adjustable bed. Mm-hmm. I see you, baby. Scooting that ass. Scooting that ass. Now, if you'll excuse me, I must go vomit. <laughs> that is it for our show this week. And like I said, I know I said we were doing with Jimmy Carter this week, but it turns out I had the show topic scheduled for like three weeks from now. And since it's Valentine's Day, uh, I thought I'd bump it up. That's how we do on the show because we are very, very bad at thinking ahead. Never fear. Brother Jimmy's coming next week, and we can put this whole sordid idea out of my of my sex life out of your heads. Speaking of intrusive and unwelcome thoughts, rate and review the show wherever you get your pods. It helps other people find the show and experience the kind of intrusive thoughts about my sex life that you just have, and everyone knows misery loves company. Support the show at patreon.com slash what the hell podcast. It helps me uh, put money aside for my pimped out rascal scooter that I will use to troll for babes at the old folks home. Do all the things that Jeremy tells you to do in the closing because Jeremy knows that retirement homes aren't cheap and he wants to make sure I can find a good one. So for me, Dave, I've spent a lifetime looking for you. Single bars and good time lovers were never true. Bledsoe, producer, and I was alone then, no, uh, no love in sight, and I did everything I could do to get me through the night. 
what does this person do? Gavin and all the fictional lonesome hearts on the show. We want to say that looking for love in all the wrong places is just a recipe for a restraining order. Join a bowling league or something. Don't be that guy. We'll see you all next week. What the hell were you thinking stars Dave Bledsoe and features Gavin St. James and several fictional minions. The show is produced by Kimberly Steele and a part of the Seltzer Kings Podcast Network. You can find more information on the show on their website, whatthehellpodcast.com, or on Twitter at the hell underscore podcast, or on Facebook as What The Hell Podcast. Thanks for listening. I have no ending for this, so I take a small bow. Ah, Valentine's. The second base of third grade.